You know, chances are really good that if you grew up building plastic models, you would always encounter this one plastic model kit every time you went into your local hobby shop, or you would bump into it frequently when you would browse your favorite mail order catalog. This kit here was something that you always wanted, but for one reason or another, never got it. And on top of that, it's not even something that's really that rare, expensive, or even that special. But when you finally acquire it, well, it does kind of make you feel whole. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com. I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale M113A1 armored personnel carrier. The model that you see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at EastCoastArmory.com. The model in this video is built predominantly out of the box and we'll be going over all the model's features as well as giving the model a thorough in-box review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of content coming right at you. To get this video started, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the ubiquitous M113A1 APC. If there was ever a tracked vehicle that closely resembled a dumpster, It'd be the U.S. Marine Corps LVT-5, but the M113 is definitely a close contender. The M113 was a very successful post-World War II armored personnel carrier design, designed by the United States. The M113's origin really dates back to lessons learned from World War II. During the war, both sides realized the importance of having infantry keeping up with the tanks, and both sides of the period utilized mostly half-tracks for this role. Half-tracks offered a lot of benefits, however, did have some drawbacks to them, in both terms of mobility as well as also with armor protection. From World War II, the lessons learned was that rather than having a half-track type system, just have a fully tracked, dedicated platform for use exclusively for the protection and transport of troops. Also, unlike the half-tracks where they were an open-top type vehicle, this new vehicle was going to be fully enclosed. This was to protect the occupants from both enemy fire, but also keep in mind 1950s and 1960s time frame, NBC warfare becomes a thing, and the best way to keep everyone safe is really to have them buttoned up on the inside. During the 1950s, the research and development was primarily being done by the company FMC. FMC would create both of the M113's predecessors, the M59 and the M75. And the M113 was going to be based upon lessons learned from both of those previous attempts. The M113 was to utilize new technologies of the era in terms of armor protection. Rather than going with standard armored steel, they're going with ballistic grade aluminum. This material made the vehicle much lighter compared to the other two predecessors and because of that it had the ability to be air mobile as well as also amphibious. Another departure from the other two predecessors was with the suspension design. The other ones borrowed and recycled parts from the M41 Walker Bulldog while the M113 was going to utilize its own suspension set consisting of its own track, sprocket, and running gear. Probably one of the biggest attributes of the M113's design though was the rear ramp. The previous incarnations would have had two small little hatch doors where the occupants can enter and exit the vehicle, while the M113 on the other hand had one giant ramp that would open up and allow the occupants to exit or enter the vehicle with greater speed and efficiency. This system was basically what was seen on the US Marine Corps LVT-4 family during World War II. For armament, the vehicle had a single M2 50 caliber machine gun. However, one nice attribute about the M113's design is that it is almost infinitely customizable. It's basically like the way the Sherman was during World War II. There are almost an endless amount of modifications and upgrades that can be added and mounted to this platform. And that's part of the reason why this vehicle has stayed around for as long as it has. When the vehicles were first adopted into service, they utilized a gasoline engine. Shortly after the time of adoption, the Vietnam War started to kick off and the M113s were sent to Southeast Asia. There they performed very well, specifically when the Viet Cong and the NVA encountered them for the first time. However, some shortcomings of the design were quickly notified and the first was with the engine. The 
vehicle being powered by a gasoline engine was a bit problematic in case the vehicle was to get hit. Apparently they didn't learn lessons from World War II on that one, but they quickly realized to swap out the gasoline engine with a diesel. After the vehicles were re-equipped with diesel engines, they received the upgrade of A1. The M113A1 saw continuous service in Vietnam where they performed very well, and then they continued to see service with the US military throughout the years that followed. The M113 would constantly be upgraded and developed further into the 80s and into the 90s, and the vehicles are still in service today, albeit in a limited role as they were a number of decades ago. Outside of the US military, the M113 was a widely successful export vehicle and basically became the de facto APC for NATO. Many of these countries that received the M113s used them to great effect and still use them and operate them to this day. Before we go any further, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started so we get a good idea of what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 1990s vintage Italeri M113A1 Armored Personnel Carrier Kit. This kit here was tooled up by Italeri in 1994, and interestingly enough, this was not the first rendition of the 113 that they made. Two years prior to this, the very first rendition of an M113 made in the scale by Italeri was the version with the dual tow missile system that's located on the top of the roof. Two years later, they went ahead and kind of worked counterintuitively by making the armored personnel version that we have here. What's also interesting to point out that for the longest period of time, if you were looking for a 135th scale rendition of the M113, your only real option was the version from Tamiya. At that time, the Tamiya kit was the, well, the original one that came out in 1975, which was the one with the full interior detailing. And then later on in the 1980s, Tamiya retooled it being the ACAV version, which gave you a few more extra details that weren't present on the original 1975 release. Another kit option that was available at the time was the kit from Academy. The Academy kit does also build into a nice rendition of the M113, and they have a few different flavors available. However, just like I mentioned in the Academy 113 rebuild video, that kit is nothing more than a product improved version of the Tamiya tooling that I just mentioned. When these kits were released, they were met with some praise, as again, the market for the 113 was fairly limited and it was nice to see some fresh tooling that was now in the marketplace. These kits were very easily come by. You would find them in, again, hobby shops and mail order catalogs for several years to come. One thing Italeri always had going forward was some very good distribution, and the price of the kits were also fairly affordable. And like I said in the pre-video bumper, this kit here was one that I would always run into at my local hobby shop. I would walk through the aisle, pick it up, you know, look at the box and say, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, anyway, I put it away and grabbed something else and, you know, that would come home with me. So this kit here was always something that was on my radar, but for one reason or another, it never, you know, made the, uh, made the trip home. And there is a reason for that. I will be touching upon that momentarily. But by and large, again, this kit was always one that I wanted to get. And now that I finally have it, it does feel good to add it to the collection. This kit here I picked up off of eBay for roughly about 25 US dollars. And oddly enough... Even though I just said that the Italeri kits are generally easily come by, this one here in recent years have been a bit on the rarer side. I don't know, maybe it comes in, you know, in waves. Sometimes there's a bunch on the market, sometimes there isn't. But this one here, I actually had a little bit of a difficulty in tracking down compared to some other kits. I presume that this kit itself is out of production. This, by the way, is one of the original 1990s releases with the box art that I'll touch upon in a second. However, Italeri themselves have re-released several versions of this kit over the years, one of which was a rebox done by Ravel Germany, and another version is the Vietnam variant with where it gives you some other extra details and fittings. That's also a really cool kit, but again, something that's out of the scope of this video. Me personally, when I was tracking down this model, I specifically wanted this one with this box art just because of the nostalgic region that I just mentioned. As for the box art itself, well, it is a M113 with its rear ramp down showing its interior. This is more than likely, of course, Vietnam, where we have probably the Mekong Delta in the background. The composition is fairly, you know, typical for Italeri works of the era. Here we have the 
little thing here that gives you all the decal options that are supplied with this kit. There are plenty that I'll touch upon once I crack the box open. And the remainder of the graphic design is typical for a tallery of the 1990s time frame. They use this italicized type sans serif font with that little drop shadow on them. If you grew up in the 90s, went to your hobby shop, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Here we have the Italery logo, nothing much there. And of course, there goes the other information. This is kit number 276, and it's in their little format that Italery likes to have on their model kits. The bottom, of course, has that yellow stripe, which is typical on kits of this era. Moving on from the graphic design, takes it to the side panel. Here we have just some corporate information. Side tab, quite typical for Italery kits of the period, with a thumbnail of the model, as well as the other information that I just mentioned. And on this side here, just some more corporate info. So, cracking open the model, and by the way, I just want to give a shout out to the individual who, or I should say the eBayer who sold this kit. He did a phenomenal job with packaging this kit up. This thing was shipped in some, I, I've never seen a model shipped this well before, and that's, that's actually saying something, since you know I do a lot of shipping and I also buy a lot of kits. Starting with the vehicle's hull that has a airbag stuffed in it. Here you can see the quality of the kit. By the way, this kit here is all comprising of injection molded parts. There are no photo etch or other type of metal bits that are supplied with this kit. All of the parts are made in this dark olive drab plastic, which is typical for Italery kits of this era. Looking closer at the quality of the molding, this one here, I believe, does have a full interior detailing set, which is why we see these little sections or indication marks molded into the inside. What's nice about the Italery kit, and this is what separates it from the Academy and the Tamiya kits, is the underhull detailing. The Tamiya kit was originally designed to be motorized, and because of that, you have a little slot for the gearbox screw, as well as that little slide section slot that's molded in for the power switch. The Academy kit, same thing because their kit too was designed to be motorized. However, Italery, that's not the case. So they actually gave you a proper detailed under hull. Here you can see this large axis hatch directly under the engine compartment as well as the smaller axis hatch that we have here. Also, unlike the Tamiya kit, the Italery does have a separate molded torsion bar suspension. The Tamiya kit, these components were all integrally molded on and it's one of the weaker aspects of that kit. The Italery kit here, it's more prototypical where we have individual separate molded torsion bar pieces that also have their shock absorbers in their appropriate locations. The Academy kit would remedy this on their rendition, but again, the Italery kit here, it's just designed from the get-go to be this way. The quality of the molding is pretty good. And again, it's quite typical for the other Italery kits of the era, and even to today for that matter. Touch upon that in a moment. Here we have, individually bagged here, the front armor plate. You get to see the quality of the, mold of the moldings, I should say. All the fasteners are present, as well as the engine grill detailing, as well as the periscopes. The periscopes on this model here are an improvement compared to the Tamiya ones. However, the Academy ones, I believe, have the upper hand because they were separate moldings that would be glued on, and because of that, you would have slightly crisper details. But that's just a small observation I could make. The remainder of the components appear to be in this green bubble wrap envelope, which is also, again, a, a, a good testament to the individual who shipped this kit. And this runner here consists of, well, quite obviously, the top hull components as well as a good portion of the interior components. Here you can see all the little footman loops and tie downs all molded. The moldings are nice and crisp. And the detailing is very nicely done. Here goes the bench. Note the cushions all have their folds and kinks molded in, which is a, again, a nice touch found on this kit. The molding for the cupola is nice and crisp, along with the details found on the other pieces, namely on the hatch and the hinge and all that. You can see some of the interior detailing here. Note the diamond plate found on this piece. This, I believe, is the fuel tank. And here you have the main floorboard, again, with all of its diamond plate rendering. 
on the inner hatch we even have the little cable which on the real vehicles is how you actuate the two little latches found on the end this is not really cable it's actually a chain that's in a like a bicycle inner tube so you would pull this down and this would simultaneously open the locks and open the rear hatch but now i'm starting to sound like i'm in one of my one six scale videos so i'll tone that down a bit on the roof here there's really no details present but again nice and clean here we have the main machine gun options for the U.S. Army and for most options of the 113 has a M2 HB 50 caliber machine gun. The M2 that you see here is your standard Italy pattern M2 HB, which I find to be okay. You know, it's not great, not terrible type thing. It's a decent gun for a out of the box offering, but if you want to replace it, there are a plethora of 135th scale M2s that are on the market. If you're building the vehicle for a Bundeswehr M113, obviously you have the MG3 machine gun located directly below, and this, or I should say, this gun here is nicely detailed in its own right. And note on the opposite side we have the slot so that you could change out the barrel, which is a hallmark found on the 42 or MG3 design. There goes the M23 cradle for the M2, and again just some more details and fixings. This over here is the indicator light, which is seen on many post-World War II vehicles, or I should say vehicles from the 70s onward till today. On some kits out there, namely the Academy kit, this is actually made from clear plastic, while on the Italy it was opaque. So, you know, this is something to consider if you're looking at one of these kits, which one has the better indicator. However, you can easily just paint this to replicate a translucent type lens type feature. Next runner consists of the components that we have here. Obviously, at one point, the hull was molded into this section, but obviously that's not the case anymore. And by the way, this is clearly a secondhand model, so this was on uh, someone's stash. Continuing with the review, you can see the main bow plane. This is something that is an iconic bit of detailing found on the M113 family, and I'll touch upon more on that after the model's built and painted. Here we have the rear hatch which is, again, an equally as iconic bit of detailing found on this vehicle. Note the detailing found on the door itself is pretty good. And on the inside, we have that really cool thread-type pattern detailing found on both the left and right-hand side of the rear ramp. The engine hatch is pretty good. I don't believe this kit has any engine interior detailing. That's one thing that is found on the old 1975 M113 kit from Tamiya, but... This one here, you know, it's a curbside model, so it should be fine. And you can see the remainder of the details, namely on the sprockets, as well as the idlers. For the jerry cans, this kit here utilizes the plastic versions, as opposed to the standard metal ones that are generally seen on most other kits out there. And some other standard staples of tank equipment, tow hitch, siren, lift hooks, tail light and a bunch of headlights. There is one interesting quirk found on the Italy M113. If anyone have watched my other Italy M163 video, you know what I'm talking about. That involves this guy that we have right here. The blackout light is installed upside down. Uh, I don't know if that's just a mistake on Italy's part or possibly the real M113 they were looking at. Some genius decided to mount the blackout filter upside down. So. You know, that remains to be seen. Moving on further, it takes us to those antenna brush guards. And then here we have the main road wheels. The details on them are pretty good, considering the age of the kit. And in my opinion, I think they're perfectly fine and will build into a nice, representable piece. On this portion over here, we have the main brush guards, which have their nice little shape them and it's something that's an iconic bit of detailing found again on the 113 family and this takes us to the last runner here which had the front plate originally molded in and this is probably the main reason why i avoided this kit as long as i have and that is of course that this kit here utilizes individual link and length track you see at this time in the 1990s time period italy decided to switch materials on their tracks and go with the indie link method and this sucked. This was a big kick in the gut. And honestly, like I said in my M163 video, was something I got donkey punched with because I wasn't expecting that when I purchased that kit all those years ago. 
The, and as for the reason why, well, quite simply put, look how much money a tallery saves by just molding everything into three runners. If they would have had a single piece vinyl option, they would have had to have another mold, a new type of material, and now a separate casting, which raises the price of the kits. And uh, that's something that Tallery wanted to try to cut on during this time period. Unfortunately, it made the models less enjoyable because these tracks are total trash and they're not gonna be used on this build, but I'll touch upon that in a second. Back to the parts that are gonna be used, you see the individual swing arms that we have here. Note the ones for the front and the back have their shock absorber details molded in. And the versions on the center have their mounting plates present as well. Here we have those two little cheek pieces for the final drives, which is just like it is on the Tamiya, actually. And here we have the, the main strut that it keeps the bow pane propped up. We have one for the deployed state and one for the retracted state, as you would also find on the other 135 scale kits on the market, namely the Tamiya or the Academy. Here we have some U-shackle mount points, some Pioneer tools, rear fenders, as well as the main rear hatch itself. Or I should say the rear wall of the vehicle itself. Back to the tracks at hand. Obviously, these tracks are not gonna be used on this build. As we know, my hatred for these tracks are legendary. So in their place, I'm gonna be using a single piece vinyl set from AFV Club. The AFV Club tracks I've used on several other of these individual Lincoln Link Cursed M113 rebuilds, and I have been more than happy with the results at hand. They are highly recommended for anyone who is building one of these builds and actually wants it to come out nice. The AV Club tracks are very affordable, they're also really easy to come by, and they go on without any real problems. At the bottom of the box takes to the instruction sheet, and it's in this typical elongated type format, which is seen on most of Tallery kits. The quality of the instructions are typical for the period. They're using what appears to be drafting type illustrations and they're not CAD drawings, which is what we tend to see on more modern kits of today. But the instructions seem to be doing a decent job. Obviously, this is not gonna be relevant. <laughs> but the remainder of the kit should go together in a fairly easy manner, so. And of course, if there's any problem or misprints with these instructions, I'll gladly point them out during the other half of this video. And in the past, I have run into oddities, I should say, with Italian instructions, but that remains to be seen on this one. And while I was repackaging everything, I forgot to point out that the vehicle, of course, gives you a set of water slide decals. The decals that are supplied with the model are standard Italian water slides, and I've had some pretty, I should say, mixed results with them in the past, where sometimes they go on okay, and other times they lead to some problems. However, unlike those builds, on this one here, it's going to be varnished with that VMS varnish, so that should give me some better results compared to the older techniques that I've ran into in the past. When it comes to decals, however, you do have quite the litany of options here from all sorts of different countries, from Belgium to the Bundeswehr, the Italian army, and of course the US military, which is the version I'm gonna be rendering for this build here. And here's the model going through its assembly. At this point here, the model is ready to have its interior fully painted and weathered, because once that's out of the way, I can then resume on the remainder of the exterior detailing. The interior itself is not fully rigged on this component at this point in time, and as you can see, these chairs here are just held in place with gravity at the moment, because trying to work around them in terms of trying to paint and weather everything is going to be a bit of a fool's errand, so these are best done where you pre-paint everything and then mount them in place once all of the weathering work is concluded. Back to what I was saying before, there are a few other bits of detailing, namely the fuel tank, the benches, as well as a few other bits of interior components are going to be fitted to the interior, but these will be done, of course, obviously, after everything is painted and weathered for the same reason that I just mentioned. One of the things I did want to point out before I progress any further was with the way the interior goes together. The two firewall sections over here get connected to the floorboards and everything gets mounted in one piece. However, I found this to be a bit tricky 
during the installation because trying to line up the, the walls and have them be perfectly square and mounted to the floorboards at the same time proved to be a bit of a fool's errand. So what I had to do was first the floorboards were fitted in place and then I carefully mounted on the firewall components. You'll notice that I actually had to go ahead and reinforce everything here with styrene angle because trying to just have the kit indexing points line everything up proved to be very very difficult. The kit does have sections molded in in order to, uh, to assist with this but in my opinion they are a bit on the shallow end and because of which it's not too hard for the pieces to over skip their mounting sections and it will just make a mess pretty quickly. So by using the angle iron or I should say the angle straps here from Plastruct, I was able to go ahead and secure everything in place in a much more secure method and one that proved to be much more cleaner. Another thing I want to point out is that, like I frequently mention my builds, I use super glue for all of the assembly and during the assembly of these pieces here, I actually, again, I was having some difficulty with it and I had a thumbprint right here on the access hatch to the engine compartment. Normally, this is just easily addressed by sanding and polishing everything with a small piece of fine sandpaper, but rather than going with that approach, I actually took some of that super solvent stuff that I mentioned in a, another model showcase video. By the way, the link for this is listed below for the Amazon link. This stuff is extremely efficient at dissolving stuff like the super glue, but it does not harm the polystyrene material. So basically what I did was I just took the solvent, put it on a cotton swab, and just wiped the area down where that thumbprint was present. In about less than a minute or so, the stuff became gooey and just rubbed right off. Another benefit or surprise benefit that the solvent had was that it also does a good job at removing that white CA gas that you get when you know you glue stuff together. You can still see some portions of it here or there, but when I first built this thing, this basically this entire area here was just bleach white. And uh, while I was taking care of that little smudge point, I said, you know, let me see what else this can do. And I just wiped down the areas and uh, it cleaned it up extremely well. And so far this stuff cleaned up that white CA gas better than anything else I've ever seen before. And I've used water, alcohol, turpentine, denatured alcohol. And uh, it, that stuff really doesn't work in getting rid of the CA gas. This stuff here, nah, it, it just rubbed it right out without any problem. So if you ever have a situation where you have some bad CA gas and you want to wipe it away but not harm the finish of something, or I should say the plastic of something, this stuff here will work really, really well. So from here, I'm just going to go ahead and spray paint the entire interior with its flat black. The flat black is just going to be used as a, as a primer base, like I frequently mention in my build videos. From there, I could then add the coat of the interior colors, which will be a Model Master Blue. Uh, it's a sky blue color. I've used this paint on many other of my post-World War II American tank build interiors, and I always did like the way that color looked on my model, so this one here is going to be getting the same treatment. After the interior paintwork is all done, from this point here, the model can progress with its build and then slide all the way into completion. However, before I do that, I might as well go ahead and get the model here on camera because obviously once it progresses past this point here with the roof and all the other details added, you're not exactly going to be able to see the interior in this sort of light. All of the detailing that you see here are the kit supply components and were simply mounted out of the box. The kit does a decent job with the interior layout, however, it is lacking in some respects. Namely, on the driver section here, the Italeri kit does not have any of the instrument panels which are present on the real vehicle, nor is it containing several of the other interior components that are found on the inside, such as provisions for mounting the radio, as well as some of the conduits and cable control mechanisms that are on the roof to open up the ramp. A lot of smaller stuff like that are just not present with the Italeri kit. However, if anyone wants to build one of these vehicles with a full interior detailing, you could use this as a good base because you can add the remainder of those details already on top of the kit components that are supplied here. The kit supply parts are pretty decent. Again, they do the job that is necessary at hand. And also, if you're going to be building one of these for a diorama, you can easily stuff the insides with so much battle rattle and other bits of equipment and accessories that it will fill up the inside pretty quickly. Just like with the Tamiya full interior M113 kits, the 
Italeri one here does give you the decals for several of the interior warning labels. Namely on this one over here for the engine hatch panel, it's a carbon monoxide warning. There is another small little label on this little piece of equipment here. I believe it's a fire extinguisher if I'm not mistaken. Or possibly an air filter. And over here we have a couple of markings on the fuel cell. Although the markings on the fuel cell are a bit interesting because if you notice it's just not legible it's just a bunch of random letters just typed in a certain configuration just to give it the illusion that there's verbiage there but that's kind of funny because it actually is legible on a few of the other markings so take that as if you may but the markings that you see here were the water slide decals and they went out without any problems in order to secure them in place further i went ahead and brushed over some of the vms varnish in order to just seal them to the model and also remove any sort of decal shine that can persist. One more quirk that I want to mention on this kit at this time are these four indication points that are found on the two sponsons. On this kit here these components are just empty and there's nothing that connects to them and more than likely a tallery built these into the into the kit hull so that it's probably an option for another M113 variant that they have or had the intentions of releasing. However, for this one here, that's just not the case. They're just dead areas of Sponson. If you're working on one of these, you could easily just polish it away with a Dremel. Fortunately for me, I didn't realize that until everything was already painted and weathered, so they're going to be staying on this model. Luckily, with the way the model is built, once the top plate goes on, you're not exactly going to be able to see those indication points that I just mentioned. Of course, when you're painting the interior, you don't just paint the main hull itself, but you also need to paint the underside portions of the roof. The roofs were painted with the same blue coloring that I mentioned before, and were weathered in the exact same manner. Starting with the model's running gear, all of the running gear components, sans the tracks, are the kit supplied units. The row wheels go on without any problems, and the swing arms also mount on fairly easily. But one thing that I do want to mention is that with the swing arms, this kit has an interesting quirk where the swing arm stems are slightly longer than they need to be. Because of this, when it comes time for installation, you run the risk where the swing arm will not fully seat in all the way. If you're trying to install these pieces and you encounter this, you may have the urge to force the piece in, but if you do, you run the risk of possibly breaking the swing arm. Either having the swing arm not fully seated and breaking it are two outcomes that are really less than ideal. In order to get the pieces to fit better, what I did was on the end of the swing arm stem, I just simply shortened it about a millimeter or two with a pair of clean cut snips. With this extra material removed, the pieces fit on in a much more streamlined way. For painting and weathering the wheels, I utilize the technique that I've already touched upon in a few other videos. Basically, I like to have the effect that shows that the bearings underneath the hubs are wearing out and you begin to get sweating as well as some leakage. The effect is done all with the paintbrush. After the model is basically fully completed, at the very tail end of the build, I take a fine point paintbrush with Tamiya Gloss Black and I paint it in a few locations. Once the paint fully sets, to further enhance it, I take Tamiya Gloss Lacquer and I go over these exact same areas. By doing this, this gives the effect a little bit more depth. Also, if you're using this technique, you don't want to use it on every single wheel. I mean, you can because, you know, there are a lot of these vehicles floating around and most of the times the bearings wear out fairly quickly. So it wouldn't be uncommon to have the, all the bearings that are shot. But in a way to give you a little bit more depth and variation, you could alternate the technique across some of the wheels. One thing though that you definitely don't want to do is you don't want to do the exact same type of streaks in the same locations on every single wheel. That is something that can actually have a detrimental effect on your vehicle's look as opposed to helping it. While on the topic of weathering the suspension, on the rear either wheel you can see that the faces have the appearance of polished metal. On the real M113 the rear idler is not rubber rimmed and because of the constant rotations of the track, this area would polish up fairly quickly, and it's something to keep in mind if you're working on any M113 family of vehicle. Hopping to the track, like I stated before, this kit does supply you with individual link and link track, and in my opinion, it is the biggest weakness and ding that this kit does have. Also, like I stated, those tracks were jettisoned and in place, I utilize a single piece vinyl track from AFV Club. The AFV Club tracks 
came out absolutely perfectly and are something that I highly recommend for use on this model. In fact, I can't recommend it enough. These tracks have all of their details represented on both the exterior and the interior sections. The exterior would include the rubber pad on the face as well as also the metal cleats. On the interior portion you have the hinge work, the inner rubber pad, the tooth, as well as even the fastener that secures the outer pad in place. The AFV Club tracks time very well with the Italeri sprocket and I didn't encounter any issues with fitting the tracks to their appropriate locations. From the tracks, hops is directly to the side skirts. The side skirts that are on this model are the kit supply ones and were utilized out of box with no mods being necessary. One thing that's neat about the Italeri M113A1 is that they rendered it with the shorter type side skirt. The earlier M113s, the rubber section would have descended further down and covered more of the top portion of the wheels. And while on that note, yes, the middle section here on the 113 side skirts are made out of an industrial type rubber. On the model here, I painted and weathered it accordingly. And this is again a trick that I utilize on all of my 113 builds. I have seen a few M113 builds out there on the internet where they overpaint this with the base coat, but this is not necessarily an inaccuracy because there are a lot of these vehicles in field and many times they were overpainted with the base coat or even camo. But you have to keep in mind if you're going to go with that route, you want to weather accordingly. The paint when applied to these sections would chip away and disintegrate very very quickly so you would have the bare rubber poking out through the overpainted sections. Again, something to keep in mind as a lot of people they don't know this and they weather it as if the piece is made out of metal and they have rust and other type of effects to it, which it shouldn't have. Moving along takes us to the rear detailing and all the components that you see here are the stock kit supply parts and were utilized out of the box with really no changes need to be made. One thing that I do want to mention though was the choice of the jerry cans. Like I stated before, the kit is unique in that it supplies you with a set of the plastic USGI jerry cans, which is something that was not seen during the Vietnam War. From what I understand, these jerry cans were developed post Vietnam and really started to make their way in the field in the late 1970s early 1980s time frame. However utilizing the kit supply jerry cans on an M113 with this configuration is not inaccurate because again the US military kept the vehicles in this configuration up through the 70s and even into the 1980s time frame. However, if you're specifically looking to render your M113 for the Vietnam War, I would recommend digging through your spare parts bin or possibly acquiring an aftermarket set of USGI metal jerry cans. Moving up from the jerry can takes to the cat's eye lenses. These are nicely rendered, but again, this is something that's commonly mispainted on several builds that are out there. The one on the left hand side here, the top portion is painted in red, while the one on the opposite side is blacked out. From the cat's eyes, it takes it to the rear ramp. Like I showcased before, the tank does have full interior detailing, or three quarters, I should say, of interior detailing, and the rear ramp is fully functional. The piece just drops down, and it allows you to get access to the interior. Also, the top hatch is fully functional as well, which, once open, gives a little bit more extra light onto the interior space. One thing, though, I wanted mention about these M113 rear hatches, and this is true for not just the Italeri one, but the same is true for the Tamiya and the Academy, and that is you have to be really careful when you're operating these ramps. The hinge work that are supplied with all these kits, they do work, but they are very frail and fragile, and without a whole lot of use, the piece can break on you. So if you're opening up, make sure you're doing it slowly and evenly, because if you're torquing it even just a slight amount, you will crack the hinge work and once it goes, you're basically done. So bear that in mind for anyone who's working on any M113 out there that has interior detailing or if you want to have your rear ramp be able to be fully function. When you want to display your vehicle with the rear ramp close, it basically just hinges back upward and fits into its appropriate location. There are these two little lugs that are molded into the ramp itself and these friction fit very nicely into the rear section here of the vehicle. Once the piece is closed, it holds it in a nice snug format and you don't have to worry about the piece flopping open on you in impromptu times. Which I shall illustrate by simply closing the ramp. And that's all there is to it. 
Moving our way to the front, there's really nothing too much to talk about. All of the kit supply components were mounted out of the box without really any changes. The one thing that I do want to mention though, specifically when it comes to painting an M113, is with the bow plane. The bow plane is something that I always like to install after the model is fully painted and weathered, and it's one of those finishing touches. The reason why I state that is because with the shape of this unit and with the size, trying to get access to the rear section here in order to get it painted can be difficult. And if the piece is installed prior to painting, you will have areas back here that the paint just will not get to. So that's one of those things you need to keep in mind if you're working on any M113 based vehicle. The other thing I typically mention is that on the real M113, the bow plane is actually made from plywood, not metal. And because of that, you want to weather it accordingly. If you're building one of these models and you want to have it look all torn up and weathered down, you don't want to have just random rust chips forming on the surface of this piece. Another thing about the bow planes to mention is that with the way the kit is designed, you have the option to either render it in the closed state or in the propped open state, much along the lines of the Tamiya one. And just like with the Tamiya one, the way this is done is that the hinge is molded with having two tabs on them. If you want to have it in the closed state, you just simply plug it in. And if you want to have it in the open state, you plug it in in that format and, you know, you have a little bit of extra work due to the prop. But if you're going to have it in either position, you have to keep in mind that when you're done with or when you make up your mind on which way you want to display it, you need to snip off that extra little lug found on the bottom portions of both of these hinges. That little lug there is solely there just so you can prop it in either the closed or open state. If you're going in the closed state, you need to snip those sections off and vice versa. This is a common technique that most people tend to forget when they're building their M113s. Directly next to the bow plane takes to the spare track links. The links are the Indy kit supply links that were simply painted and weathered and mounted to the vehicle. It's really the only thing they're good for in my opinion. For the paint and weathering work, I utilize the same techniques that I use on the main tracks. Just like I typically mention in these videos, US tanks feature tracks that are made from a metal and a rubber type material. The rubber typically is found on the outside portion as well as also on the inner portion where it makes contact with the road wheels. The M113 is no different and the pieces are weathered accordingly and this is again true for not just the spares but the main track links themselves. When you're working on an M113 regardless of the make this is something you need to keep in mind because it's very easy just to render this whole piece being metal. Moving up takes to the bow headlights, specifically the blackout light. Now this is something that I touched upon earlier on in the inbox review portion of the video, but just to reiterate, this little scoop here is molded on the Italeri kits upside down. Is this something that was a mistake on Italeri's behalf, or possibly the piece was mounted upside down on the real M113 that they were using for reference? Nobody knows. However, the kit is greatly improves if you go ahead and you mount it in the appropriate manner. The piece was simply just snipped off and then mounted in the appropriate position. Once done, this completes the look and it really helps improve the model tenfold. Moving up takes to the exhaust manifold, which is one of the more iconic details found on the 113 family. The kit supplied unit was molded solid, as is true on several of the other kits that are on the market. In order to improve it, the only thing I did was with a Dremel and a small bit, I went ahead and bored this section out, giving it for the more realistic look that we have here. Moving along takes to the two crew hatches. The driver's hatch is non-functional, I just simply mounted it in the closed position. You do have the option to mount it in the open state if you so desire. The periscopes are molded in, so painting them is something that has to be exhibited with care from the builder because you don't want to have the paints run on you which can obviously hurt the look. Also you have to keep in mind that the brush guards are molded into the periscope prisms as well and this is another thing you want to avoid getting any sort of paint on. For the prisms on my models, I've mentioned this a few times in the past, but I like to use gloss black for them. Some individuals out there like to paint them in blue or silver. Me personally from crawling all over these real ones whenever I get a chance to, from what I noticed Gloss black seems to be the best way to replicate that. On the Commander's Cupola, same thing with the driver's hatch. The hatch is an optional piece to be rendered either in the open or closed state. And on my models, I like to have them all buttoned up. One interesting feature, though, that the Italeri kit has over the Tamiya pattern ones is that the cupola can fully rotate. The piece is basically held on just like a turret where you have two little locks and corresponding locks found on the cupola itself. 
you just find that little sweet spot and the piece just drops directly in and you can rotate it completely freely. While on the cupola, this takes to the top mounted M2 HB 50 caliber machine gun. And this piece here, like I touched upon before, is your standard copy paste M2 HB that is found on just about all of Italeri's American tank model kits. Some people would consider this kit gun here to be a bit of a ding and there is some merit to that. The component itself is a bit on the softer side detail wise and there are some errors with the M23 cradle. However, for this build here, I just simply used it out of the box as it works fine for my building question. But if you want to really improve this kit here from the stock offering, I would recommend swapping this out for a 3D printed M2HB that's found on Shapeways that has the M23 cradle on it and it should just be a direct drop in for this unit here. That model I have used on several of my builds in the past and I recommend it highly. In fact, I'm going to be ordering some more of them for some OTR builds that are in the lineup, but more on that is to follow. As for painting the M2, my typical format, I spray paint the weapon with a can of flat black. The scratch surfaces are dry brushed on, and then the grips are painted to represent Bakelite, as well as the Crayle components are painted in olive drab. For the ammo can, I went ahead and painted the little numbers and letters that are typically found on the ammo cans, but in 135th scale, a little, few little dots from a fine paintbrush is enough to give the illusion that the pieces have their appropriate markings on them. It's a simple piece of detailing to add to any sort of ammo can in the scale, and it's one that really helps polish the look of the model compared to leaving it just, you know, painted OD. From the cupola now takes to the antenna bases, and the kit's really cool is that they give you two antenna bases and their different versions. They give you one MP65 and the other standard post-World War II spring antenna base. The MP65 is very nicely detailed, and if you are building it with this component, you want to render it in the format that I have here. On the MP65, the bottom portion is your red porcelain, while the remainder is a rubber stem. The piece on the real one is completely flexible, and the antenna would plug onto it. However, in 135th scale, trying to have a metal antenna on this section here is a bit problematic. So generally on my MP65s on my smaller scale builds, even my 1.6 scale builds for that matter, I tend to leave them antenna-less, which again is also appropriate. For the other spring antenna base, this is your typical, again, Italeri post-World War II US spring antenna base. Detailing on it's pretty good. In order to secure the antenna wire in place with a pin vise, I carefully drilled out the center portion, and then a small piece of floor wire was simply mounted in place, as, you know, was typically seen on my builds. Moving to the rear hatch here, you get to see the component fully completed and also in its functional state. If you are very careful with how you install the piece to the model and use just the right amount of glues, you can also accomplish the piece to have full function. As for the detailing, like I touched upon before, the piece is nicely detailed and they did properly render the little chain that's found that connects the two latches together. Also, like I said before, they rendered the little rubber tube that's found on the sections just to prevent your hands from being caught up in the chain. It's a nice little detail touch. In order to make it further pop with a paintbrush, you simply carefully paint over that little center section, which again would be a black rubber tube. Closing the rear hatch takes us to the rear tools. The tools are again standard Italian US AFV tools that are copy and paste on all their kits. Detailing on them is pretty good and I personally don't see a need to replace them with any sort of an aftermarket part. Also while on the back here you get to see the fuel cap and in my typical fashion I have a little bit of a spillage going on with the, uh, the fuel tank, but again it's another way to add a little bit extra pop to your model. This now takes to the paint and the markings, and well, for the model's paint, it's pretty simple. These M113s from the era would have just been olive drab, so I went ahead and painted it accordingly. But I went ahead and gave it several washes and tints to give it this sun-faded, beaten look that we have here. For the weathering, this was all done with the airbrush, as well as some dry brushing techniques were also utilized. For the markings, I went with the kit supply water slide decals, and they went on with pretty good results. The one marking though that gave me a little bit of a snafu was the A16 bumper code that we have right here. The kit supply one was mounted, but then when I went to apply the remainder of the markings, when I looked again, the decal was no longer present. It must have blown off somehow. Luckily, I rummaged through my spare decal bin and found a matching number and typeface that blends in with the other markings found on the model. I believe this one here might have been Dragon or Tamiya. 
doesn't really matter. Regardless, the decals themselves were just painted over with the VMS matte varnish for the reasons I've touched upon in a few other videos. That product is highly recommended in getting rid of the decal shine, as well as it's also a good way to preserve the decals, securing them to the model, protecting them from years to come. At the end of the day, I'm really happy in how this build turned out. Like I said earlier on in the video, this was a kit that I always wanted to pick up from my collection, and now that I have it and built it up to the condition that we have here, it is a decision that I really don't regret. Not to mention, it also feels really good to scratch this one off of the to-do list. And that's a perfect point to slide us into skill level and recommendations. The kit itself builds very well and fairly quickly. Because of the overall simplicity of the vehicle in question, the model goes together without too much extra work being necessary by the builder at hand. However, because of the kit supplied individual Lincoln Lane tracks, as well as the added complexity of the interior detailing, I can recommend this kit to a beginner. If you're the type of person who never touched a plastic model kit before, this is definitely not going to be the kit to use as a way to springboard into the hobby. This kit would be the type of thing that you would springboard off of when you're entering into some kits that are a little bit more complex compared to some of the easier kits that are on the market. Because of that, this model here is really more or less meant for someone who's an individual with intermediate to an advanced range. However, one addition that is basically, in my opinion, mandatory to add to this model are the replacement of the stock tracks with some kind of an aftermarket source. Be it the single piece vinyl tracks like I used on this one here, or an aftermarket workable track link set of one flavor or another. The addition of either of these sets would be a massive improvement compared to the stock tracks that are supplied with the model. Not only would the vehicle's build complexity decrease as well as also speed up, but the overall look and appearance, in my opinion, would be far greater than if you kept the individual Lincoln Lane tracks. An advanced builder can easily tackle one of these kits here, but admittedly they may feel a little bored with some of the kit supply details and features. But one thing to consider is that this vehicle has a gigantic range of aftermarket components that are on the market. Not just for the M113 in general, but many of which are specifically intended for use on the Italeri M113. Some of the aftermarket parts that come to mind are made in photo etch, cast resin, as well as even in 3D print. The addition of a number of these items, or all these items, would greatly improve this model from the stock configuration, as basically the Italeri kit out of the box is nothing more than, well, a blank open canvas. If you want to pursue it and add upon it, you're basically free to do so. Bouncing into recommendations, this kit here is obviously recommended for anybody who's interested in modeling vehicles from the Vietnam War. Outside of that type of a builder, if you're the type of person who just digs the M113 or you see yourself as an M113 aficionado, this kit here is a must-have to your collection. Another person who I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who's a fan of building U.S. military vehicles or just Cold War vehicles in general. If that sounds like you, well, this kit here would be a nice welcome addition to your collection. And because of this kit's Full interior detailing feature, this would make it a fantastic candidate for use in a diorama setting. Another advantage that this kit has is that because the M113 was such a widely exported vehicle, this particular kit specifically supplies you out of the box with several NATO specific components. Because of this, as well as the decals, this opens up the spectrum on how you can actually build and render this vehicle. If you want to build it for the Bundeswehr or for any other type of NATO countries, this kit here, in my opinion, is probably a better choice compared to the Tamiya counterpart. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale M113A1 APC. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being 135th scale model showcase videos like this one over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop a new post of content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been posted in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, and I'll see everyone again on the next one. Take care.